We're going through every single question in May 2025, paper one for Maths AA, so stay tuned. First, we have ln3 plus ln4. For this, we have to use the rule of logarithms that says that for two logarithms of the same base that are being added, we can multiply. Um, so in this case, it's ln3 times 4, which is ln12. The second one, we're using another rule, which is that uh, if we have a number multiplying a logarithm, we can put it as an exponent. So in this case, 3 ln2 becomes ln2 to the power of 3, which we can simplify to ln to the power of, uh, sorry, ln8, if you want to. Then we have minus ln a half, which we apply the same rule to, so to the power of minus 1, which then becomes ln2. Next question, we have a function, they're asking for the local minimum, whenever that's the case, and it's not a quadratic, with a quadratic it's easier, but it, if it's not, we basically do uh, the derivative always, so the derivative in this case is 4x squared, because the 3 in the exponent becomes a multiplier and divides over the 3, and then minus 16, because the x is lost. We then make it equal to 0, and x is equal to plus minus 2, but p, remember, is uh, positive, so it has to be 2. And then to find out q, since q is the um, y coordinate, we can substitute p into the function. So 4 times 2 to the power of 3 over 3 minus 16 times 2. We then simplify this, so 4 times 8 over 3 minus 32. We simplify it even further, sorry, 32 over 3 minus 32. We then multiply the 32 times 3 to have it as a fraction as well, so 32 over 3 minus 96 over 3. And ultimately, that gives us minus 64 over 3, that is q. Okay, hopefully this is simple. Next question, question three. Bob invests 1,000 dinar in an account which pays a nominal annual interest rate of 4% compounded quarterly. So I'm gonna put the formula here for the final value. Um, careful though, in this formula there is a K. This is not the same K as the one in the question, okay? Um, the K in the question is the R over 100 K, okay? So when they're asking us for a K, it's R, which is four, because that's the 4% over 100 times four, which is uh, the number of periods. Since it's quarterly, there's four periods. So that k they're asking for is 0 0.01. Then they're asking to expand and simplify 1 plus x to the power of 4. 1 plus x to the power of 4 is the same as 1 plus x squared times 1 plus x squared. So then we can uh, simplify either uh, and then multiply all of the terms one by one. Tedious, but not too difficult. Just be sure to not miss anything. So once we do that, we then add the terms. So 1 plus 6x squared plus 4x to the power of 3 plus x to the power of 4 and we're missing the x so plus 4x and that's it okay and in c they're asking us to find the amount of money that bob has made so we know it's a thousand times 1 plus uh, k to the power of 4 since we know k is 0.01 it's a thousand times 1.01 to the power of 4 so we Basically, again, super tedious, we have to multiply 1,000 times 1.01 four times. So the first time it's 1,010. The second time it's a little bit more, so it's 1,020.1, right? Because that 10 adds that 0.1. The next time it's 1,030.3. Do you get the gist here, right? Uh, the 10 and the 20 then add a 0 0.1, 0 0.2 to the next addition, and then the final one is 1030.3 times 1.01, which is 1040.7, and to the nearest dinar, that is 1041 dinars that Bob will have. Next question. Find the areas enclosed by the curves y equals e to the power of x, y equals minus e to the power of x, and the lines equals minus 1 and 1. So this is the integral of 1 minus the other with the bounds minus 1 and 1. So e to the power of x minus minus e to the power of x is obviously 2 e to the power of x. Um, since both the derivative and integral of e to the power of x is e to the power of x, this stays the same. So we basically have um, 2 e to the power of x with the bounds 1 and minus 1. So we can substitute 1 and minus 1, and we got 2 e to the power of 1, right? Minus 2 e to the power of minus 1. And we can put that as a fraction, so it's 2 e minus 2 over e. That's simple. Next up, question 5. In question 5, we have events a and b. So we know that the probability of not a is 3 fourths, and the probability of b conditional on a is 2 over 3. So the probability of a is just 1 minus 3 over 4, right? Since the probability of not a is 3 over 4. That's simple enough. We then know that the probability of b conditional on a is 2 thirds, and we know by definition that that is the intersection of b and a over the probability of a. Since we know the probability of a, we can solve for the probability of a intersection b, which is just going to be 2 thirds times 1 over 4. Simple enough. In part b, we have to show that events a and b are independent, but we do not have enough information yet to show that events a and b are independent. So what we first want to do is we want to find the probability of b. So to do that, we know that a union b equals a plus b minus the intersection. We know all of these except for the probability of b. So it's super easy. Probability of b is 
2 over 3. And since the probability of B is 2 over 3, which is the same of the probability of B conditional on A, that means that B is not conditional on A, right? Because the probability of B conditional on A is the same probability as B, meaning A and B are independent. Okay, question six, this one is hated by all. So, but it's actually not that difficult. So we know that both the width and height increase by 50% with each frame. So this is a geometric sequence with each, right? So we know that U1 for width is four. So um, UN is just going to be U1 four times R, which is three over two to the power of N minus one. And then same thing goes for the height. The height follows another um, geometric sequence. In this case, uh, un or ln let's call it being five times three over two to the power of n minus one it's still three over two right because it's still increasing by 50 percent and so then we can then multiply these together for the frame because we're talking about the area here right the area of the picture f of n is going to be w n times ln so 20 times 9 over 4 to the power of n minus one all right then it's asking to find the mean area of the 10 picture frames so we can calculate the sum of the 10 first picture frames using the formula for the sum of a geometric sequence. So we know U1, so we can start with that. So U1 is going to be 20 times R to the power of N. We know that R is 9 over 4, N is 10, and same in the denominator. We can then simplify this. So we got 9, we got the same thing in the numerator, but at the bottom we can do 9 over 4 minus 1, which becomes 5 over 4. We then divide the 20 by 5 over 4, so we get 16, 9, over 4 to the power of 10 minus 1. But the mean, of course, is not the sum of the 10 first terms. It's the sum of the first 10 terms over 10. So we do that and we get 16 over 10 times 9 over 4 to the power of 10 minus 1. So we now know that P equals 16 over 10 and A equals 10. Easy peasy. Next up, now we have to find the median area. Okay, the median area is the middle point, right? The middle data point. But in this case, because there's 10, there's no middle. The middle is 5 and 6. So the median is basically 5.5, so we have to calculate the fifth and the sixth, and then add them up and divide by two. So we know that the fifth is 20 times nine over four to the power of four, and the sixth is 20 times nine over four to the power of five, and we then divide that over two. So we can then um, extract, right, 20 times nine over four to the power of four, and we simplify a little. So then we got one plus nine over four, which is 13 over four. So then we can multiply the 20 times the 13 over four over 2, and we get 130 over 4 times 9 over 4 to the power of 4. 130 over 4 can be simplified to 65 over 2 times 9 over 4 to the power of 4. So Q is 65 over 2. Next up, question 7, kinematics. So an object moves in a straight line. Its velocity is given by the following formula. So when we're being asked for the object's maximum velocity and maximum speed, remember velocity is positive. So in that case, it's at t equals 1. You can see there's a maximum there. So you substitute and you get the max velocity is 40. On the other hand, for the speed, it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. And you can see that in absolute value, the largest value in this graph is at t equals 5, even though it's negative. So we calculate that and it's minus 120. So the speed is 120 at its maximum. At t, the object changes direction. That's obviously when the velocity is zero because that means it stopped and then it turns back. That's t equals three. And to find the distance traveled by the object in the first three seconds, we do the integral of the velocity between zero and three. So that's gonna be 30t plus 10t squared minus 10 over three t to the power of three. We then substitute the three and the zero. The zero obviously makes them all zero. So it's just a th three that matters here. So it's going to be 90 plus 90 minus 90. So we then do 90 minus 90 zero. So it's basically 90 that it's traveled in the first three seconds. Next up, we have to determine whether it returns to its original position. For that, it would mean the displacement would be zero. So we do um, the integral between zero and five, right? Between the start and the end point. And same thing as before, um, we just substitute 5 and 0. 0 is going to give 0, so just 5 matters. So it's 150 plus 250 minus 1,250 over 3. So in total, we get minus 50 over 3. So obviously, it does not return to its original position, right? There is a displacement there. We have a function, a quadratic, and we have to put it in the vertex form. So first step to putting in the vertex form is finding the x-coordinate. If we know the two solutions, which in this case are minus 1, and minus three, right? Those are the two x-intercepts. The vertex is always in the middle. So the middle between minus one and minus three is minus two. So now we know that h 
is minus 2. And then to find k, it's as simple as substituting the minus 2 into the original function. So 5 times minus 2 plus 1 times minus 2 plus 3. And the solution of that is that k equals minus 5. So now we know that f of x can also be written as 5 times x plus 2 squared minus 5. a is 5, right? We know that from the original function. Okay, next up we have to sketch the graph of f of x. So since it's asking intercepts with the axes, we have to find the y-intercept. Um, the y-intercept is when x equals 0. In this case, it's 15. Now that we know that, we also know uh, the x-intercepts because it's given in, in the actual question, right? And we know the coordinates of the vertex. So it's as simple as drawing the function with minus 1, minus 3, minus 2, minus 5 as the vertex, and 0, 15 as the y-intercept. And I'm horrible at drawing, so don't judge me for this. But um, yeah, it'll be much easier in the exam when you have the grid. But something along the lines of what you're seeing should be valid. Next up, we have to solve the inequality of f of x being smaller than 40. So we can use either the vertex form or the original form for this. It does not matter. I decided to go with the original just because I liked it more. Um, <laughs> but we simplify and we basically um, multiply everything out. So in this case, I decided to divide both sides by 5. And then I multiplied out x plus 1 times x plus 3 to get x squared plus 3x plus x plus 3. Smaller than 8. And then... What I did is I took the 8 to the other side as well. That's why you see 0 on the other side. And then you can literally solve this like any quadratic. You make it equal to 0. You get that the two solutions are minus 5 and plus 1 by factorizing. And now, because it's an inequality, you have to find at which point f of x is less than 0, right? Not 0, less than 0. And you find that it's less than 0 between minus 5 and 1. If you take x equals 0, you'll find that it's negative. Therefore, the solution is x bigger than minus 5, but smaller than 1. Next up, we have the second part to this, which is completely different, to be honest. And it's that g of x equals ln x. So we have to write the expression of uh, g inside of f. So g is the x, right? So it's 5 and then ln x plus 1 times ln x plus 3. That's simple. But then we have to solve the inequality of f of g being smaller than 40. But we can steal the solution from before because we know that it's minus 5 and 1, right? Which is great, but now instead of x, it's ln x, because that's what we've substituted into x, sorry. But then we can then just redo the substitution into e. Okay, next up, we have this whole shebang. Holy frick, right? But first, let's consider triangle ACB. And they're asking for an expression of h in terms of r and theta. Okay, so we know the hypotenuse is 2r because it's 2 times the radius, that's the diameter, right? And that base is uh, 2 times the big R because, again, it's the radius of the base times 2. So cosine of theta is going to be 2 big R over 2 small r, and therefore big R is equals to R cosine theta. Simple enough, I hope. And then to find h, we can do the same with the sine. Sine of theta is going to be h over 2 small r, therefore h is going to be 2r times sine theta. Okay, now we're asking, uh, well, they're asking for the total surface. So the total surface is obviously the surface of the base times 2 plus the surface of uh, sort of the side of the cylinder, right? So the base is pi r squared. So in this case, it's 2 pi r squared because there's two bases. And the lateral area is going to be 2 pi r times the height. So first off, for the bases, if it's pi r squared, Remember, we know that r in this case is the big r, right? Not the small r. That's what we're talking about here. We also know that the big r is r cosine theta. So we can make that squared to get pi r squared cosine squared theta. But again, remember, there's two bases. So it's going to be 2 pi r squared cosine squared theta. So those are our two bases. And now for the lateral area, we have 2 pi r, which in this case, again, it's the big R times the height. We can substitute the big R for r cosine theta, and we can substitute the h for 2r sine theta from the exercise before. So now we add these two up. So it's 2 pi r squared cosine squared theta plus 2 pi r cosine theta 2r sine theta. I'm going to go insane from saying all of these. So now what we have to do is we have to simplify. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to multiply all of those things in the second term. So we get 4 pi r squared cosine theta sine theta. Now, 
look at what we're wanting to get. There's no cosine squared theta. So we change it into 1 minus sine squared theta, and the rest stays the same. And what we can now do is we can extract 2 pi r squared from both terms. So we got 2 pi r squared, brackets 1 plus 2 sine cosine theta minus sine squared theta. And that is exactly what they were asking us to show. Now, the next part is the external surface area of the sphere is 2 times s, which remembers the total surface area of the cylinder. So show the tan theta equals 2. So um, the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi uh, r squared. That's just the, by definition, right? So we equal it to uh, 2 times um, the surface area of the cylinder. And we can then cross out that very conveniently. So we get 1 plus 2 sine cosine uh, minus sine squared theta equals 1. We then cross out the 1s. So we get uh, 2 sine cosine theta minus sine squared theta. We extract the sine theta from that. We can then cross out the sine theta because it equals 0. So 2 cosine theta minus sine theta equals 0. We then take the sine theta to the other side. So 2 cosine theta equals sine theta. We divide everything by cosine theta. So sine theta over cosine theta equals 2, which means the tan theta equals 2. Simple. Next and last, the volume of the cylinder is V. So the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared times the height. In this case, remember the r is the big R, which is r cosine theta. So r cosine theta squared. And the h, remember, we also know from the previous question, is 2r sine theta. Now we need to figure out what sine and cosine are. So we know that the tangent is 2, which means that the ratio of the opposite to the adjacent is 2 to 1. So we can make up values and say they're 1 and 2. And from that, the hypotenuse would be root of 5. There we can figure out that cosine theta would be 1 over root 5, and sine theta would be 2 over root 5. These are not real values. We're just making them up because we know what the ratios are because of the tangent. Doing that, we can then substitute into the volume, and we get that it's 4 over 25 times pi times r to the power of 3 times root 5. Therefore, p is 4 over 25. Okay, that is the last question. I know we went through this really quickly. I'm more than happy to clarify anything in the comments. Best of luck with studying, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.